Right, hello and welcome to episode 41 of the Repto Chat podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Um, this one is a pre-recorded episode, so if you're watching the premiere on YouTube, do remember that we won't be chatting back and forth in the comments uh, because it's not a live episode. But hey-ho, uh, right, quick bit of housekeeping and then we can get our guest in the studio. First up, Patreon. Uh, thank you very much to all the Patreon supporters. Your contributions make running this podcast just that little bit easier and it encourages me to go that extra little bit and uh, keep making awesome content and some not quite so awesome, but we make it anyway because I like it and you guys like it. If you want to join the Patreon, uh, that's the wrong slide. That's the wrong slide. Where's the slide gone? Oh, I'm having a mare of a day today, folks. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Bear with. Uh, I want that one. I pushed the wrong thing. Um, yes, so if you want to join the Patreon, there is a link in the show notes below. Why would you join the Patreon? Well, you get early access to podcasts that are pre-recorded and any uh, Repti vlogs that I make as well. As well as that, you get access to the Repti Squad Discord. Uh, we're slowly building a nice little community over there. Um, so you can come and chat and ask questions. And there's no, it's like a judge, judgment-free zone. So you're welcome to come and join that as well. Um, not only that, I get the offer. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm struggling today. Not only that. The patrons get a chance to submit any questions they want to every guest beforehand. So all the patrons will know who's coming on every episode um, before anybody else does. There's also stickers and merch on the way. Patreon starts from as little as a pound a month, and there is even a seven-day free trial, so you can come and join in with no obligation to pay and see what's going on. Anyway, moving on. Uh, today's guest is someone that I've been chatting with on and off for a fair amount of time recently, and um, I've been following them for a good while as well. He keeps a variety of animals, but today's main focus is going to be on dart frogs. So, without any further ado, please welcome Ben Bailey of Rural Reptiles to the podcast. Good afternoon, Ben. I'll get through the intro eventually. It's lovely to have you on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. I'll have a, no worries. How are you, first of all? Yeah, I'm, I'm really good, thanks. Yeah, the, uh, Fantastic. the sun's out today. So that makes I'm glad it is where you are. <laughs> it has been raining here all day. It's horrible. Oh, that's not good. Um, so, if you haven't listened before, I like to start every post episode with uh, the, this or that, or like the get to know questions. Um, mm -hmm. So, they're just a series of this or that questions. If you're happy, we will get started with them, and then we can get into the podcast afterwards. Yeah, all right. Yeah, fantastic. So, first up, cats or dogs? Got to be dogs for me. Yeah, uh, good. That's what we like to hear. Everybody asks yeah. if we turn the podcast off if they say cats. So, um, <laughs> second one: snakes or lizards? Um, yeah, I think I'll go snakes for that one. I think frogs or salamanders. Well, it's got to be frogs, hasn't it, for me? Yeah. It's got to be frogs. <laughs> um, centipedes or millipedes? Um, might go millipedes with that one, I think. Nice. Uh, spiders or scorpions? I'll probably go scorpions. Birds or butterflies? Uh, good birds. Yeah, I like a bird. Nice. I like a bird. Uh, grasslands or woodlands? Hmm, that's quite a tough one. Um, I might go woods, yeah, woodlands. Yeah, I like a nice walk in the woods. Um, beach or mountains? Uh, I think I'll go. I think I'll go with the beach. Nice. Hot climate or cold climate? Uh, I'll probably probably go cold. To be honest, I don't yeah. do well in the heat. That's fine. <laughs> um, and then most the most important question of the entire podcast: What's your favourite biscuit? Um, I had a good think about this one, and <laughs> I really like a shortbread. 
I think that counts. Oh, good shout. I like a shortbread. I'm, I'm really yeah, nice, good. Oh, yeah, I love a shortbread. Yeah, very good. Right, now that's out of the way, it's time to get into the meat and potatoes of the episode. So, Ben, could you give me and the listeners a sort of history lesson into your sort of reptile-keeping career, for want of a better word? Where did the spark sort of yeah. ignite, and how has it evolved into where you are today? So, I'll try not to go on too long with this, but... You can go on as long as you want, honestly. <laughs> I I actually got my first snake, which is a corn snake, when I was four years old for Christmas. Um, it's actually about one of the early mem- earliest memories I sort of have. Yeah. And I had that for, I think I, then I got a bearded dragon, I think, when I was eight. Um, mm-hmm. And then I, I literally only had those two things um, until they passed away, which they, they both last. They both lived quite a long time. I say, yeah mid mid teens i think when they passed okay. away um and sort of in the meantime of that um so I, i'm on a i don't live on the farm anymore but i'm on a family farm here and yeah. i used to cycle to the all my mates used to live in the closest village which is about yeah. three miles away i used to cycle there basically summer holidays i just used to go and we actually used to go looking for grass snakes frogs common lizards slow worms yeah. so I, I actually spent a lot of my time doing that so while i only had the two pets i was actually really getting into wildlife at that time yeah and then sort of after the pets passed away sort of a teenager in school i i kind of like got not got out of it. i always enjoyed wildlife but i never really ever thought about keeping anything again didn't really know much about it but I was always into wildlife. Like yeah. Steve Irwin for me was like it is for a lot of people was the yeah. big one. But... Goat. Yeah. <laughs> and then um and then it all started again, actually. My um I think we were just about well, we were just in the process of buying a house, me and my partner, and we went to she wanted a a hamster, I think, or a guinea pig. So we went to pets at home and there's no reptiles or anything in, in my local one, but there was a couple of books on the wall. I was like, oh, I used to keep snakes. And yeah, we went and found our closest reptile shop and we didn't get a hamster or a guinea pig. We got a royal python. And that was nice. early 2020, I think. And okay. I was an adult and I had adult money to spend. And I kind of went nuts like a lot of us do. Yeah. Um, and then this sort of past year, I've, yeah. I, I went nuts, got loads of different things, and I've still got most of those things. Um, but I just, after a year or two, I really started to find what I liked and sort of focus in. Yeah. So, dart frogs for me um, is one of those main things, and then a few snake species. But I, I still, I still have all sorts. But that's sort of the main. Yeah, thing. yeah. No, that's and, exciting. Okay. And then, sort of last year, I so a lot along with that time when I was a kid, we used to go down to the local village looking for reptiles. I actually chucked out tins on a farm. And yeah. this was when I was probably, I don't know, nine or 10. And just completely random, I'd come from home from school and the odd time I'd find the, gra- I got the old grass snake or, or whatever. Anyway, last year, I really started getting back into wild stuff. And I put, I found some of my old tins from about 10, you know, 10 12 years ago. <laughs> and I put loads more out and I started finding grass snakes again. And then now come this spring, I've I've just really tried to get into more of the wild stuff. So at the minute, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to focus in on what I'm keeping, but I'm I'm really getting into the. Um, the yeah, the I have. A, I've things. got a section slightly later on in the episode. Okay. Um, talking yeah. about your herping because you are inspiring me every day at the moment. Um, but we'll keep going with the uh, reptiles for now. So you said you got yeah, um a fair few bits more. I don't know if you can you still hear me. Your camera's frozen. Oh, yeah, I, I can hear yeah. I'm not frozen. That's fine. As long as you can hear me, yeah. I'm not fast yeah. as the camera freezes. doesn't matter. That's cool. Yeah. You're back now anyway. Um, so before we touch on the frogs, I do. Uh, there's yeah. a few other topics I want to touch on first, and we'll finish up okay. with the frogs. So if you guys are listening just for the frogs, you're going to have to hang around for a little bit. Um, so first up, I want to talk about the reptile keeping, because I've had a bit of a like a deep dive in your Instagram, and it looks yeah. like you've got quite a, a varied selection of animals. At home. Yeah. Um, and it's not just snakes either, is it? So what... No, no, ignore, no. Ignoring the frogs, what reptiles are you keeping at home at the moment? Right. So I did write a list because 
I, I like a man that comes prepared. I probably end up forgetting stuff. So, um, just to say as well, I'm actually the, where I am now. The reptile room is so, like I said before, I don't live on the farm anymore. I've got a house with my partner, but I am on the farm now. Yeah. And you know, like a porter cabin sort of building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's about 38, 40 foot long, 12 foot wide. And it was nice. the farm office, which I have taken over. So <laughs> that's where nice. I am. Uh, <laughs> sort of, so I, I can keep quite a bit of stuff. And yeah. I've got some ginormous walk in enclosures as well. Yeah. So. But, but yeah. So what I keep. Um, so I start with snakes. I've got um, I've got a few Amazon tree bows. Uh, I think I've got I think it's two point one adults, and then nice. I've bred them the last couple of years. Um, yeah, I saw on your Instagram you had some babies as well, and that's yeah, that's, so, that's really so cool. they're, they're they're pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I've got those. I've got um, a couple of green tree pythons, uh, the Bayak locality. Um, they're both males. And I cannot afford a female, unfortunately, <laughs> or find one. So <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. But uh, they they are probably my favourite snake species, to be honest. So yeah, I'll be keeping them anyway. Um, I've got a pair of spotted pythons, a pair of children's pythons. Um, I have a corn snake, um, which I kind of took on. And I think he's about eight years old when I said come on, so and that was about four or five years ago. And he's he's a big he's a big boy. Yeah. So and like a lot of the single animals I have are just pets, but yeah. I've got a few like just a few things I'd like to breed. And then I've got a pair of palmetto corn snakes. Nice. Um uh single royal python, just wild type. Um I've got a young pair of Arizona mountain king snakes. Yeah, I saw those on your Instagram, they're really cool. They're, 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 they're pretty cool. Um, I've had them. Uh, when did I get them? Yeah, coming up a year now, probably. Um, so that's yeah, they're growing quite well. Um, I think that's all the snakes. Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah. Plus, I've got I've got palmetto corn babies. I've got a few left over. Um, I'm keeping most of my Amazon babies from this year, but. Yeah, the Amazons are really cool. Amazons aren't, they're not one you tend to see as often as like normally people I, go yeah. emerald tree blowers or they go green mm. tree pythons. Yeah, I'd so love it's nice to see something a bit different. I'd love an emerald. Um, same genus, Corallus. Um, yeah. But they're so expensive. And, yeah. Yeah. Not, not bred as much. Yeah. So. There's a few people that yeah, yeah. really, like, they're doing a really good job, but they're still not that available. Um, yeah. Yeah, lizard wise, I've got. Um, I've got two Aki's. Um, again, one of those was one that I took on from someone. Um, yeah, so I've got two Aki's. I've got, and then in the big walk-in enclosures, I've got um, one is an eight foot by six foot by six foot, and that's got a green iguana in, and um, it's actually, well, I've, I've got two. Enclosure. I've got two red foot tortoises in the bottom. Um, yeah. Obviously they're, they're from the same area in the wild. And yeah, I, I've sort of done that one up fairly recently. I did have my Argentine black and white tegu in that one. Yeah. Um, but I've moved that one. So she went down for hibernation. So while that was happening, I rebuilt that one for the iguana and the two tortoises so they could have a bit extra room. And then she's come out of brumation and gone in what the iguana was in. Which is still big. It's eight foot by four foot by six foot. So yeah, um, some nice size enclosure as well. Yeah, you can walk straight into it, and yeah, they're they're pretty cool. Um, they were one of the first things I actually built in this room. I wanted to build the big enclosures out first. To, yeah. Um, no, it must be nice to have that sort of expanse of space as well, because mo most people yeah. are like, and obviously you are restricted, but yeah, yeah. Compared to most keepers, that's a, a, a big footprint to be able to build stuff in. Yeah, so I, I don't have the whole thing. I've probably got about, uh, I don't know, 26, 28 foot of that. Yeah. Um, and one corner is still, I don't know if you can hear that frog in the background or not. I can just about hear it. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Um, one part is still the farm office, so I haven't completely yeah. taken over. And then there is a back room, which I was, I really want to, when I have time, build into and sort of make that 
a soul frog room. Um, yeah. But I haven't got to that point yet. But yeah, I think that's yeah, everything apart from the frogs. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. So obviously you've mentioned that you bred the Amazon tree butters. Um any yeah. of the other obviously you've got a fair few pairs of reptiles yes. there. So is there um, anything else that you have bred? Obviously the corns as well. Yeah, um, so the not, what are you planning? Yeah. The the Amazons, um so I, so last year would have been the second time that I bred. They were actually first species of snake I bred. So the first time I bred oh. them was not last year, but the year before. Yeah. So I've bred them twice in a row now. Um they're only small litters. The first one was only three, and the second one was only five. But yeah, the, the female was sort of just coming up to age. If if I had gone over it again, I probably would have waited an extra year. But yeah, like they're fine. The babies came out big and nice and stuff. But so the palmettos, I bought as babies. I a few a few when I was just getting into it. So I reared them up and I bred them for the first time last year. Okay. Um, and I had um the female double clutched but the second clutch wasn't all fertile so in total it was 30 eggs which is crazy but i think i ended yeah. up with 20 22 22 young yeah wow yeah but that was the fit like obviously amazon's alive that's still, so that's still that a lot of mouse food. yeah so but that was yeah so how did you find the going range. from so how did you find the the difference between like the amazons obviously being live bearers mm. and the corn snakes being egg bearers yeah. um, how, um how did you find that just completely yeah completely different things um i really like the live birth um from the amazons it's you know she turn up turn up the heat slightly i actually wrote uh, an article for ek magazine last well it was a few okay. months ago but it came out last yeah. month so um about breeding them and stuff but yeah yeah they're, they're pretty cool like obviously she stays in the enclosure the whole time and uses the heat to throughout gestation but it's a it's a from ovulation or post ovulation shed, I think, yeah, but four months you have to wait. So right, okay, yeah, so it's quite a long, it's a long, time. it's a long old while. Yeah, and then obviously going to the corns and the eggs, it went, it went really well to be honest. Um, obviously corn snakes are one of the easiest species. Yeah. To um, and I'm just sort of finding that out now. I've so I do have a couple of pairs. So the childrens and the spotted pythons, I actually got eggs from the childrens. I think around Valentine's Day. Um, okay she laid so i did try to breed them last year but they both ended up slugs so obviously i i probably done something wrong there with the males but um so obviously going from colubrids to pythons again completely yeah. different again and i didn't really didn't have much didn't know much what i was doing but so this year the children the yeah. children's female laid i think she laid 14 or 15 and i'm down to eight now um but there's only okay. a couple of weeks till they hatch although i came in this morning and the incubator was off so someone's great <laughs> so we'll see how that yeah. goes so how, how, when was the last time you checked again. it was it just like i took off uh, night hopefully i was in here yesterday but yeah and the rooms fair like they were still at they were 22 degrees so well, 10 they're probably degrees, be but, fine. They should be, but they might be okay um, yeah but yeah i had a problem with those like the, so like the corn snakes i just chucked them in vermiculite and they were fine yeah the children's they started mold i was actually away for three or four days and they started molding, so I'd already lost three or four eggs by the time I came back. Okay. And they were and they were just laid as well. So, um, yeah. so I'm down to eight, and I think six are probably look pretty good. And the others, two are questionable. The other They're okay. Yeah. But the the spotted female, God knows what's happened. She went through the shed cycles the same, and she hasn't laid any eggs, and it's just been over. Probably I don't know. So something went wrong there, but that's yeah, they do do that sometimes. Uh, they snakes like to put you through the ringer. Yeah. And you know, spotted and children's they're supposed to be fairly easy pythons to read. I'm struggling with it, so not well, the breeding part, but it's all eggs. it's all practice and getting the eggs and it's all a little time on them. exactly. It's all yeah. yeah. To be fair, with the mouldy eggs, you might find. I know you said you got six that look good and two that are a bit questionable. Mm -hmm. You might find that they hatch absolutely fine. I've seen some really mouldy yeah. eggs hatch in my time. Uh, they're not um, so much mouldy now, but um, yeah. to be honest, it was more. I think I was more struggling with hydration. I think I overhydrated them, right? And they got over moistured, and then, yeah, so they sort of swell up and like sweat a little bit. And then I think I made them a bit too dry, and uh, <laughs> so I've been struggling along the way. But we're still got eight, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, no, that's good. I'm sure. I'm sure. Hopefully, they'll um, they'll all go. To, it'll go to plan. And you get a few babies at least. 
Yeah, be, be nice to, yeah, see him hatch yeah. out. Yeah. Um, and then you said, obviously, you've got two male uh, chondros. Is the plan yeah. eventually to get a female? I, I Yeah, I'd love a female. So I bought yeah. I bought them both as neos. One was a red neo, one was a yellow. And, um, yeah. I've had them for just over three years now. Or, okay. Yeah, I think so. They're about four, yeah. four and a half years old. Um, but yeah, it's just like it's a it's a weird thing with if you, it just on a side note if you if you went to america captive yeah. bred green tree pythons for they're up to like 1500 2000 yeah. dollars um the imports you can get adult biac imports over there from what i've heard over there for like 400 dollars off the table at a show That's in the uk i think the most recent ones or the second to last most recent ones for babies are like 900 pounds for yeah. the baby biac captive bred ones they're not they don't come up very often but if yeah. you if you're looking all the time like like i do look all the time some of them are like 500 quid it's completely backwards <laughs> but yeah and then but then i suppose the only downside of that is as well is you can't well you, you I, do they, when you get them as near i presume you're getting them unsexed yeah they're yeah because because they're quite I, delicate i presume you can't they sex are, them. They are quite delicate. People don't tend to sex them. Like I think most people just wait. You can they'll shed out plugs or yeah. the males will shed out plugs at about two years old. So I think most people just sell them as unsexed and that's what you end up with. I bought mine both unsexed. I just ended up two males, but yeah. Oh, I'll enough. be keeping them. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I love them. They're, I think they're amazing. But yeah, they are like they are really cool snakes. I, th- I think green tree python is probably what there's probably one of maybe three snakes that i think about keeping again now now i've moved away from yeah. the snakes um, yeah there's something about them green tree bob and zemble tree bow is just just they're cool mm. animals they are cool animals yeah, yeah. um and then you said you got a pair of red foot tortoises as well are they are, are they a sex um, pair or have you just got two no not not yeah i've just got two so i bought we bought one as a youngster a few years ago so that one's probably just over sort of hand size now, I guess. Okay. And then the other one I bought at a show last year as a baby. So they're yeah. different, like different sizes, but they they get on all right. There. They've got yeah. they've got a hell of a lot of room to. Like, I'm a big fan, a big fan of red foot tortoises and cherry head tortoises. And if I had the space, mm-hmm. I'd love to keep them, but I haven't got the room for them, unfortunately. Yeah, they are they are pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just wander around on the bottom, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. The fact that you are able to give your iguana such a massive space and then still utilise the floor for the tortoises as well is really cool. Yeah, well, like the iguana uses, don't get me wrong, the iguana will come down sometimes just to steal the tortoise's food, but he, he'll come yeah. down. And, but obviously he's sitting up. I've got like, um, so there's a ledge in one corner, sort of four foot off the ground. And that's, I've got a Thermal Zoo Pro over that. Um, so that's his main yeah. basking area. And then I've got, we had a giant ash tree fall down a couple of years ago. So I've got some giant tree limbs in there. Um, and then, yeah, the floor space, nice. eight foot by six foot, purely for two little tortoises. So it's nice to... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. So you, I presume there's quite a deep level of substrate in there. And if they're that small, do you find that you, you're you losing um, them or are they always out, out of help? It's not too It's not too deep. It could do, be a bit deeper. It's probably, I don't know four to six inches maybe but okay um the little one can get lost sometimes yeah. <laughs> oh dear um that's cool it, what it sounds like you've got a really good selection we could have like a round i know we haven't finished this one but it's quite easily yeah. go round two and talk about something that isn't frogs but the main topic yeah, yeah. of today's episode is frogs and people are yeah. hopefully here for the frogs and um so yeah before i get onto the frogs i'm teasing mm-hmm. people i want to talk yeah. about uk herping yeah. Um and and not only UK herping but YouTube as well because you've recently okay. started a YouTube channel and you're posting some really yeah. good like herping content. So I don't know if you've seen but I myself have I, just I started a UK yeah. herping series yeah. on the ReptiChat channel. Mm-hmm. Um and I have to say yours is much better than mine because I spent most of the video IDing every amphibian wrong. <laughs> Um, yeah, but everyone uh, in the comments on the live chat was very happy to tell me, and I've gone and done some swatting up, and I think next yeah. video will be a bit more accurate, <laughs> to say the yeah, least. That, 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 
I, I did uh I didn't notice, but I saw the comment and I assumed uh, you'd found out already. But yeah, yeah. I was gonna say <laughs> those first, I was gonna say those first four frogs definitely weren't frogs, but <laughs> No, well I, uh, I had uh, Paul's monitored sent me a video today, he's <laughs> out herping today, and he sent me nice a video thing. of a common lizard and the video went something like um i think this is a toad but i'm not yeah. quite sure so i'm going to check my book um which i thought was very funny but um yeah, yeah. No, but, but that, talking to common lizards it looks like you have yeah go on sorry Karen. Uh, i was just gonna say that's what that's what it's all about isn't it? it's all about uh learning finding out what names we have finding stuff about them. yeah and you can go along and you can do that with your subscribers or, or... yeah exactly i am losing together, you so. slightly with you Oh, okay. No, it's all right. Uh, you're back again. I'll say that again, sorry. Okay. You just dropped off completely there. Ah, I was just going to say, like, it, it's what it's all about. You can sort of go along and learn while you're doing the videos and learn with your subscribers as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I um, I, I went, after that video went live, I spent probably a good hour, hour and a half going, what is the difference between a frog and a toad? And why can't I tell the difference? And I think now... I can tell yeah. the difference quite 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 clearly and yeah. I felt like a bit of a tit, but it's all part of it and it's all part of the fun, it like is, you yeah. say. It is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a um, good um Yeah, go on. Well, it looks like you've got a lovely yeah. population of common lizards specifically nearby you. Yeah, so um on the farm itself, um we get grass snakes, um common lizards, which I've so before I've only focused in sort of one corner. We have about yeah. seven acres of marsh wetland, um, which runs. So whereabouts in the world are you? Don't... Oh, I'm in, I'm in Pembrokeshire, southwest Wales. Okay. So um, yeah, so we've got about seven acres, and it sort of runs the border of the farm to next door, and it goes sort of marshland. There's a river in between, and then the neighbour's got the same. And then on one end, there's a woods that sort of runs. It runs probably a mile to across all of the farms to a road basically yeah on, on on the way to that village i was talking about earlier but so stuff comes in from well it would have originally come in from a lot of different areas but yeah so i focused on one corner and now uh, i'm sort of panning out and trying to find stuff on the rest of the farm so that corner has grass snakes common lizards um i found some toads there recently under boards. I actually went down there earlier and I heard a toad calling in, in the daytime, funny enough. Yeah. Somewhere, I don't know, I couldn't find it. But So down there, there's that. There's probably newts in the ditches as well. I haven't looked specifically in those ditches. Yeah. Obviously, the, the grass snake's main diet is amphibians, so there's going to be yeah. amphibians for it to feed on. Yeah, yeah definitely. Recently, I found two more populations of common lizards. So on our driveway, which... If anyone's seen my Instagram, I've been posting. There's one that comes out every day, and then a pair. Um, yeah, I, was I think they're a pair. pair earlier. I think they're a pair, and then I haven't seen the male in a couple of days. But he, yeah, they've been coming out together, and then I also saw a young one on that same piece of felt yeah. earlier. And literally, I put those pieces of felt down purely because in the past I've heard scuttling in the hedges, and yeah. I happened to put it down where there was lizards, and yeah, they've just come out and used it to bask on, which is great. Yeah, and, and you've I got found... some really quality, like the pictures and videos that you're coming up with at the moment are, every time I look at them, I'm like, wow, <laughs> that is mad. Like, the, you've got to look really, really impressive. The Yeah, the videos are just on my phone, but I do I do have a camera, and it's not, nothing, it's really nothing fancy. I got it last year for my birthday. I wanted to get into photography a bit, purely. Mate, I was, yeah. I'm really into birds as well, so originally it was for birds, but lenses are so expensive to get long lenses, so... Lenses are very expensive. Um, but funnily enough, before I started podcasting, probably 10 years ago now, I did a lot of bird photography um, and then moved into weddings and now I don't do anything because weddings ruined the fun for me. But I really, I'm a, yeah. I'm a birder at heart. I do, yeah, I do love a bird. But yeah, I found more common lizards now and um, um, toads spotted all around the farm and the boards. And I just filmed yesterday. I just went for a quick dip. We've got a couple of ponds here. Which I actually dug out cool. with a digger when I was a young teenager, and I went, yeah, yeah, I went for a dip, and I've got a short video coming out of some newts as well. But so we we, awesome. we get we get on the farm, like that, that. So there, there's four species. If we have smooth newts as well, that's five species. I've never found slow worms, and it's wrong habitat for adders. But that is literally all species that Pembrokeshire has. Oh, and yeah. frogs. 
as a kid, I used to tumble over frogs and toads here. And for whatever happened, for whatever reason, we now don't get any frogs here so far. We get some toads still. Yeah. But um, which is good, they're still here. But frogs, I'm struggling to find frogs, and they're probably one of the easiest things people can find. So. Well, especially if you're identifying them as uh, you're identifying toads <laughs> as frogs, and they're really easy to find. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. No. So that's that's cool. It sounds like you've got so sort of a nice little. I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but a nice little population or a few populations yeah. at home that you can sort of monitor. And like you said, you've got the pair that you've been keeping an eye on as well. So yeah, you're getting yeah. to learn like the characters of the animals and the individuals as well, which is nice as opposed to going, oh, there's one, I've seen it. Yeah. And obviously the other day I found my first adders, which was, um, yeah, yeah, down, down at the Pembrokeshire Coastal Path is one of the sort of fairly well-known strongholds for adders. But yeah, so I, I, I've been looking for spots. I found three spots now. Um, that was one of them. And I, yeah, I went back a week later and I found my first adders. And honestly, I was, there's something else. Like, yeah, what, they are. They cool. are they're coming across them was something else. I, when like, when you see it. them, when you get a, a pair of males and you see them do their, like the, the dance wrestling thing, mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. The first time I saw it was at RSPB Minsmere over right, on the yeah. East Coast. And my wife and I probably stood and watched them for three, four hours. Like we went, we went there to see Bitten, and we saw yeah. a Bitten, which was cool. Nice, and then yeah. I was like, I want to watch the snakes. The snakes are really yeah. cool, and we spent ages watching them. Yeah, they, it was really good. Yeah, they were. I've they were really something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah come. Sorry, I've, you dropped out there, but I think I've got you back again. Yeah, they were. Yeah, totally amazing, and the scenery. Like on the video I posted, I blacked out quite a lot and covered bits of photos, but yeah. Which is, I don't know. I didn't know whether to do it or not, but better to do it. To be fair, if it's your little secret, if you're, if it's not, if it's your little spot, and you don't want the world it, and their wife coming to interrupt it, then I don't see a problem with it. It's not so much people like if I knew people that wanted to come and go out and find some animals, I'd happily take them. But yeah, just in case it got into the wrong hands of someone, or, you know. It's, yeah, no, I it, think that's yeah. probably wise. I think all of the future videos that I do. I'll tell them roughly where I am. Not I'll be like I'm in Sussex, or maybe yeah. even a bit more specific. But I yeah, won't yeah. go. I'm at this exact place because I don't like you say. You don't know who's watching, and you don't want some idiot that has a vendetta against yeah. snakes to um, go and ruin it for everybody. But yeah, that was um, yeah, that was but, really cool. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, so what made you decide that you wanted to start making videos about it? Because your having videos are really good, and I'm really enjoying them. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, I go out and look for the stuff anyway. Um, if I make a little video of it and stick it up and other people want to watch it, then so be it. But it, yeah. I don't know, it's just there, I guess, for me to look back on of things that I found as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But, no, that's um, fair enough. Fair enough. The, but I'm, I'm and really... then finally on the herp thing. Oh. Yeah. Go on, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm really bad with technology. Like, I've only found out yesterday that you can flip vertical videos to horizontal on the iPhone and all this rubbish. So, um, uh, for making. Not. I didn't like, know I... do that anyway. I'm not yeah, an iPhone I'm... person, unfortunately. I'm, I'm terrible with technology. So, hopefully, they're all right. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it's all a learning curve, though. Yeah. 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 Um, cool. And then the last, last top, like, last question on the herping so much. Um, mm -hmm. any tips for newbies, much like myself? Um, if yeah. they wanted to get stuck in, go and find some UK natives. What advice would you give them? Because you are doing a great job of it at the moment. Um. So, first of all, look in your local area. Um, one thing that I do and um, yeah I don't know if anyone else does this or not but if you're like my my county is quite a touristy county so we have we have this page on they have a page on Facebook and it's called Pembrokeshire I love it right yeah and if you go if your county has a page if your local town has a page go in that in the search bar and search snake or lizard don't necessarily search a species because this will be a lot of normal people finding it. Like it could be a slow worm and they'll say, 
what is this snake that I found. But if you yeah. scroll through, you'll you might get areas of where people have found stuff. Um, again, the reptile page, like the reptile amphibian page UK, go in there, search a county. You people won't be giving away locations in there, but it'll say they'll might post and say, I found these today in so and so county. So you know what species there. Um iNaturalist, it's not very good for the UK stuff, but there is odd records and it'll tell you much more details um, of where people have found certain species. And then huh. get yourself a field guide. I think the ARC does a really good, I think that's the one I've got. It's really good. Um, yeah. It'll tell you habitat information in there and then go on Google Earth and just put all those things together, maps, locations, types no, of habitat. Um, bear with. I lost, I lost a second there. Sorry, I, I, we, I, you went blank at um, that's all right. Come on. Um, I lost you at the okay. ARC field guide, the ARC yeah. field guide. Okay, so yeah, get yeah, get yourself a field guide, and then if you put all those things together, um, like searching through pages, locations, ah, bear with folks. Habitat types, um, put it all together and go on Google Earth and then look for those things, what you found out in those areas. And you, Google Earth's not great, it can come across pixely, but you'll get the general idea. Yeah. And then if you see an area you think's good, go and check it out. You might not find anything, but go and check it out, walk it. Um, that had a spot the other day. I picked my daughter up from nursery the Friday before. And we went for a walk for a couple of hours and I found the spot. And then the next Friday, it was actually my birthday. So I had a couple of hours off in the afternoon and I, I went back and the, ha- the weather wasn't even great, but I yeah. found so much stuff. So just, just put all the info you can find together. And if you know anyone local as well, ask them. They might not tell you yeah. specific locations, but they'll give you general ideas, general areas. And no, don't fantastic. search don't search so hard don't search so hard okay. Do, don't look if you're walking up a hedge line or something don't try and look at every single leaf as you're going don't try and look in every little thing just take two or three steps back walk a bit slower and it sounds silly but don't look specifically widen your view a bit and you actually end up seeing so much more stuff right, okay. just I know it's I know. I think that's sounds you, fantastic you, advice you, you, You'll just notice more. It sounds yeah. counterintuitive, but you will just notice more. No, it makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Fantastic. Well, there you go. If you're listening and you want to get stuck in and go and find some UK natives, there's a fair few tips there. So um, go and see what you can find. And if you do find anything, take some pictures and tag me on Instagram as well. Um, so let's get it to what the people may be here for. Who knows? I don't know. Um, yes. And that is frogs. So yep. we've got about 20 minutes left. So we've okay. got 20 minutes to talk all about frogs. So yep. I know next to nothing about dart frogs, except for the okay. fact that I really want some. Yep. And at some point in my life, two or spe- two, one or two species will probably make their way into my house. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so treat me as a complete newbie. Like I do know a few little bits and bobs, but my knowledge might as well be zero because it's like patchwork, odds and sods. Yep. So could you tell us what species you keep? why yeah. and why you decided to keep those species out of all the species that there are okay yeah so um i keep um i, I guess the internet it, will survive i guess it's five species but some of them i've got multiple localities of uh I, I think that's um so i keep currently the phylobates terribilis which most people will know as the most poisonous vertebrate on the planet um so i keep the yellows or goldens um the mints and the orange blackfoots so there are three main localities of those um i keep phylobates bicolor uraba which is same genus as the terribilis different species um yeah i keep dendrobates auratus which most people know is green and black um now they have 
does they they have dozens of localities and they are completely different between them so there's so many to choose from between that um like that specific species yeah. um again dendrobate i keep dendrobate is tinctorius azurius the blue poison frog and i also keep dendrobate is tinctorius yeah. alanus alanus again there's mul there's well over a dozen um locality types of tinctorius I keep those two currently. Um, then I keep Ufaga, Pamilio. Um, most people know as a strawberry poison dart frog. Again, there is 30, 40 plus localities of those. Um, I keep two localities currently, and that's yeah. the Bribri and the Almirante. Um, yeah, that's all the darts I've got currently. So I've got 10, 10 tanks. Um, Yep. Well, ten group, ten groups, ten tanks. Um, there's five species there, but obviously they're split up locality-wise. And in the dart frog hobby, it's a you'll see it in zoos and you'll see it sometimes in bad pet shops. It's a big no-no yeah. to keep. Not even different, obviously different species, but different localities of the same species. It's still a big no-no if they breed right. and. Because they will breed, obviously the different local the same species, different localities. If they do breed, you'll get yeah. like mutts or whatever out. And if yeah, you yeah. you might not know, but if you don't know and you end up selling that on, and then that person doesn't know, then it just gets muddled up. So it's best to keep species, yeah. and then within species, localities separate as well. So, but but no, that's, that's what perfect I'm... sense. You want to keep them as yeah, as, keep that blood as, as separated as possible. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's. So that's what I'm keeping currently. Um, I really like the Phylobates genus. So I've only got yeah. So I've got four tanks, but I've only got two species currently. Um, right. Um, um, and you said yeah. that you, you frogs are really sort of where you found your passion. Yeah. As a, like, what is it about frogs that you love more than the rest of the stuff? I'm honestly not too sure i i do love everything but the dark the, i don't know the dark frogs yeah. just do it for me they just do um like the the building of the vivariums like they're constantly changing with the plants inside of them growing and cutting back and and then you can watch the whole life cycle if you wanted to in, in the tank in front of you like you can watch them breed lay eggs like they will some species do it better than others but they will sort of move tadpoles as well if you don't take them yeah. out they don't all feed them but they will move them to a water source so you can see the whole life cycle and then obviously like most people do like i do with the darts that don't feed their young you can, you take them out rear them and then you will see from tadpole to froglet and yeah. i don't know it's just yeah i just really enjoy it um no, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've got lots of little, uh, lots of questions in my head. So they might not come out in a, yeah. a specific order about frogs, but I'll just say them as I'm thinking of them. The first thing, because you mentioned tadpoles there, yeah. Obviously, when I see frogs like native UK frogs, that like, definitely aren't toads, but are frogs, they are sitting on like yeah. a puddle of spawn that has probably yeah. got to have what 150, 200 tadpoles in it. So, yeah. are you getting to, like ridiculous amounts of tadpoles and then if so say you get 100 tadpoles how many tadpoles are making it through to being frogs okay so it, it's it's very different so in the tree and leaf frog world they will lay similar they mm. will lay hundreds into the thousands oh, possibly catch up. um well with folks we're a bit internet laggy today can you hear me um oh we're back we're back yeah, you got me. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so so in the tree frog and leaf frog world, they'll they'll lay hundreds, possibly into thousands, similar to the UK's common frog and um, other species like that. Um, dart frogs are completely different. So and it's different within species. So okay, um, Tinctorius, you might get in the height of the season now. So as it starts to get warmer, spring into summer, you you might get um, sort of up to ten maybe a few more max right but they'll possibly lay that um every 
it depends really they could lay it once a week they could lay once every two weeks so is that so lay it, is that 10 uh, at roughly at each each time they lay yeah yeah right. so it can change depending on feed availability and yeah. stuff like that but um they'll lay regularly but in smaller and smaller amounts um so that's tinctorious um i guess the dendrobates or us um s- similar amounts um to find about it's the, the terribilis they can they can lay quite a few more that the people will get clutches of 20 of them i never seem to get that many i'm sort of the mid-teens maybe right. and again they can lay that every week with food availability in the right conditions okay and then what's the um, success rate of those tadpoles going on to being frogs yeah. so generally pretty successful if if they're all fit from what so you might get some that mold over that aren't fertilized properly but the ones yeah. that do make it through they tend to make it they tend to make it all the way yeah. oh, okay um and ge- generally with those species um I now do it differently to when I started, but the terribilis, I rear the tadpoles communally um, okay. in tubs. The tinctorious, I did start to raise communally, but they started to eat each other quite a lot. So right. I, now, I now do rear them singly in cups again. Yeah. Um, or us, again, I rear them communally. And I'm, I've not got, some people use like bubble filters and stuff. I don't generally. Um, yeah. I'll do water changes maybe once a week or just top up their water once a week. Okay. And then they've got um, the main thing that people use is like Indian almond leaves to get tannins in the water. Um, yeah. At the minute, I'm just using native oak leaves. Um, yeah. It's not getting as much tannins, but it's doing a similar job. And then I'm just making sure I feed them enough so they don't cannibalize because they, they, they can. Yeah. Um, and then what are you feeding tadpoles at that sort of size? So... I'm feeding them at the minute. I'm using, um, I think, fluval bug bites. It is. Um, they're just, yeah, little granules of stuff. But there's right. other stuff I've used. Um, Rapashi Soylent Green, is it, in the past? It's just like an algae gel that you can right. okay. make up. Similar to like a Crested Gecko diet, you mix yeah. it up. And, um, yeah, and they'll munch on. If you put any bits of moss in, they'll munch on bits of moss and other bits and bobs. But yeah, generally that's that's what I'm rearing them on. And again, different, slightly different between the species to what they're hatching out at. Terribilis hatch much faster than Tinctorius, I find. Terribilis can be laid and tadpoles hatched out within two weeks. Right. Sometimes it takes three weeks for a Tinctorius egg to hatch out. Um, okay, and then how so long... Yeah, so roughly, they are they about, going from tadpole to frog, or they all take, yeah? So they all they all take about three months. Um, okay, three months to being out of the water, and yeah. then at that stage is probably where they can be the most finicky. So you obviously want smaller prey. At, at that, so at that stage, I'm taking them obviously out of the water. I, I'm rearing in tubs, and again, I've changed recently. I'm actually using a sponge filter mat as a bottom of the tubs. Right. Um, then it's just leaf litter on top and i'll take plant cuttings from my main vivs when they overgrow and i'll just chuck them in there obviously they don't attach and plant but yeah um so and i'm i'm feeding them it depends some some of them come out big enough to take um small fruit flies others will not be big enough and and so i'm giving them springtails but i'm giving them a mixture of each either way wow i can't i can't imagine i think that that small that it uh, like a fruit fly is too big for it that's mad yeah so so some of them are coming out you know smaller than your little fingernail and that's not even the smallest dark frogs that come out wow. so uh, on a separate thing you've got the ranatomea species which i don't keep any of but i know they'll cannibalize so people keep them singularly and they'll come out a lot smaller right. and to go in a different direction again the ufaga familio so ufaga the name means egg eater um so they are purely maternal care. The mother will move the tadpoles once they hatch in the tank. And in, in the tank, I'm keeping big bromeliads. They'll drop them off in the bromeliad axles, which is the little pools of water. Yeah. Um, and they will feed them unfertilized eggs until they come out about two months later. Right. Okay. So they're complete maternal care. So at that point, they'll crawl out of the water and they are minuscule. They're, you know, half a small, half your small fingernail for the smaller wow. species. Wow. Um, so I, I leave them in the parent tank, actually, until they're about three months old. And then once they're at three months old, 
the next batch is already coming out. Yeah. So once they're three months old, I'll take them out and I'll rear them in a tub then. And Perfect. so age wise, most species you can Yeah, so once they get past the finicky first bit, they're they're fine, they're they're pretty good, sturdy, you can sell them about three months old for the Tinctorius, the fire you know, the final babies and stuff like that. The Ufaga Familio and other Ufaga species generally you want to wait at least six months. Right, okay. So it's a much longer process. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. And and again, the the they don't lay as many, so you'd be lucky to sort of get ten to twenty froglets a year from Ufaga Familio, yeah. purely because they're rearing them themselves. And again, the large Ufaga, which I don't keep any of, I'd love to, and I hopefully will one day, but they are so expensive. Um, yeah. I don't think they're too expensive just because they are so they can be really hard to breed and there's some people in the uk doing really good work with them yeah um but they so are they are expensive. they are available if you are in the right group chats and stuff like that but yeah they are a lot more expensive okay that's interesting to know um, so like i said we're gonna i'm gonna jump back and forth and because i don't really have a, a set plan of how this yeah. goes. but yeah um the housing i've I, 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 presume it's slightly different depending on the species but could you give us like how are you keeping them and feel yeah. free to go into like as much detail as you want because obviously there's going to be some people listening that are interested and want to know exactly how to do it or how you're doing it yeah no worries um so i, I keep a sort of variety of different tanks mainly because i, I keep an exo terrace currently a lot of the more seasoned dark keepers as they get more into it, keeping like the Euro style tanks. But generally I've just picked up second hand exoterras where I can. So that's yeah. what I've got. I like them. They, they work to a certain degree. So, um, yeah, and you can pick them up on Facebook marketplace cheap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, shall I, I can show you a couple if you want. Yeah, you can show us a couple. You have to talk through, cause obviously there will be some audio listeners as well, but I'm sure the guys watching yeah, no, will be I'll, interested. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk through it. Um, so, I don't know if I can flip the camera or not, but I'll just go uh, with... Yeah, that works. I'll just go, yeah, so this is sort of my wall. Um, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, this is my big display tank. Um, it's a three foot by... Well, the biggest XO, whatever that is. Yeah, it's a 1990... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, I'm pointing this the wrong way, but so I'm I've changed over time how I'm keeping things slightly. So now I'm more going with a tree fern panel background, or you can get cork backgrounds or something like that. Yeah. Um so I'm silicon in that on. And this is my final bit is terrible yellow tank. There's six in here. Wow. Um you could probably have a lot more in here, but that, that i'm keeping that at six so yeah for now so yeah a lot of plants you can do foam backgrounds as well but i'm generally going for tree fern panel backgrounds now silicon and on um the substrate level again i've changed over time i used to use the hydro balls a lot but now i'm using like a filter foam level this has got stones but a yeah. level a few inches a like a mat in between and then a few inches of soil substrate and generally i'm using like arcadia earth pro for that some yep. people mix their own you can use different things it doesn't really matter Ooh. Good catch. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's what yeah that's what i'm using for substrate and then most one of the most important things for um darts is leaf litter okay. you really want to pack out that um leaf litter in the bottom they hide in it, it keeps them dry, it keeps them off the wet. If, if the substrate gets wet underneath, it keeps them off that. It's really important. Um, right. Especially, like, finally, but some frogs are more prone to, like, something go wrong with their feet. It's like a, like a fungal disease. I can't really remember what it is. Something like okay. that. Um, awesome. But, yeah, terribilis can get that. Yeah. So you want to keep, and froglets, froglets will hide in it all the time. You really yeah. want to keep it. I can't stress that enough. Leaf litter is one of the most important things. So if um, are you using, like, are you going to the woods, grabbing a bin liner full of oak leaves so, and whatever else is on the floor, or are you specific? Yeah, so, so, so when I started, I bought it, and it's really expensive. 
um, especially to do loads of tanks. Yeah. So then I started collecting. Um, you want to know where you're collecting it from. So I collect and certain trees as well. So on the farm, we've got some big beech trees. Um, so I'll collect some of that in the autumn. And I know there's nothing gone on the ground here. Yeah. No pesticides, no, nothing like that. I know what it is. Generally, if you're in the woods, again, generally, there's nothing going to be going on in the woods with that sort of stuff. So you can pick up a lot of people, you know, if you've got on like an oak woodland. Yeah. Like last time I picked up a massive like Sports Direct bag for life thing of oak. Leaf yeah. Litter. And it lasts a long time if you do it that way and it costs nothing. Yeah. Some some people will dry it out and then some like before I've microwaved it in small batches just to kill off anything off. This last time I didn't do anything. Yeah. I've had no ill effects. Yeah. Take to that what you will. I'll probably carry on doing it. But yeah, like if, I've if used you, just yeah. untreated, like untreated for want of a better word, just straight yeah. out of the woods, straight in the yeah. enclosures. And I've never had any issues with it. But like you say, it is at people's own risk. <laughs> Yeah, so, and then I, I do keep small water dishes. Some people would advise against it. Like, I'm talking, you know, tiny little dishes. Yeah. Just so they can soak in, because they do, they do like to soak, and it'll get any dirt off them. Right. Um, dark frogs can drown each other. Like, Dendrobates tinctorius, they really need to be kept in pairs as adults, because females will fight, and they will try and drown each other. Right. Um, Phylobates terribilis, Dendrobates auratus, they do really well in groups um and obviously it's just a really shallow dish of water literally just yeah. so they can soak up um so i do that some people don't you don't really want a water feature they can drown each other in certain situations right okay. um and then so yeah plenty of plants plenty of leaf litter now different things for different things this is a new fargo familio tank it's a fern okay. background and it has this big bromeliad in the middle. So that's obviously what the parents are rearing the young in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, heavily planted. Yeah, it looks great. There was, yeah, so there was just a little frog like that somewhere. But, um, so I've got a couple of those like that and I, I quite like that style. And the Pamilio tanks I'm keeping are the 45 by 45 by 60s. Yeah. Um, gen, um, pair of Tinctorious. I've got some 45 cubes. Um, apart from the display tank, my final bit is Terribilis. I keep four mints and four orange black, but obviously separate tanks. Yeah. In the 45, um, deep 45 high, but 60 long. Okay. I probably wouldn't keep too many more in that sort of size. Um, so yeah, do you find, yeah. sorry, do you find that they need the height, so to speak? Because I have got at home a 90 by 45 by 30 tall um that okay. is penciled in for dark frogs, but i haven't 100 percent decided yet you 30 tall did you say yeah yeah so you you can yeah. generally i'd go for at least 45 tall to be honest right, um yeah. and i've started to like the 45 by 45 by 60s even for a pair of tanks i've got yeah. i've got my alanus and alanus in one of those sizes it's just a nice size and they'll yeah. They'll use whatever you give them, similar to a lot of species we keep in captivity. They will yeah. use what you give them. Yeah. Um, and they will use the full height, I presume, as well, like even in your big yeah. 90 by 90. Yeah, like um, one's half, like they chill out on the floor, but he's on a big bit of wood there now. Yeah. The others are blue. Yeah. So cool. Um, yeah, they do, they do use it all. Um, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you can use varying amount of plants. I've used all sorts. Some plants suit better. Tall worms aren't necessarily so good if they're going to outgrow the tank. Yeah. Um, but creeping plants, yeah. And then for frogs that use them, like Pamilia, um, like the large Ufaga, like Ranatomea, like Bromeliads are kind of a, not a must, but because they use them. But you can use them as like accent, accent plants in the other tanks for the other species. They might sit in them. They won't breed in them, but they'll sit in them and stuff, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, and then lighting and heat lighting and heating actually. Yeah. What sort so, of temps um, and all that sort so, of So okay. So um generally with dark frogs you want to it's better to heat the room or have a heated room. You don't really want to heat a singular tank. 
and it depends how warm you keep your house obviously this is a room i keep it heated and it's heated with a lot of other vivariums and stuff yeah you want to be in the like you don't really want to go much lower than 18 degrees overnight and then sort of 24 to 26 at a height in the daytime okay. you can go lower i've sometimes come in and my heat has failed and it's gone down to 12 degrees for a night and it's not been great but it's yeah. survived i have lost some in a big freeze i lost like one like maybe one a year or something right okay. and so you, you can lose them if they get too cold but like it depends what sort of house you're in if you're in a really old house it's not going to be as warm as a new yeah. house my my house is my house wouldn't be great for keeping them yeah um but the sweet spot i guess is like 21 to 26 degrees right um, okay. they can go like, like i said a night drops fine 18 degrees will be fine you don't really want to go much lower than that and then yeah. in the height of the summer like this room will get 30 degrees yeah so they're okay for a short period you know they're not it doesn't hit a certain temperature in the wild and then yeah yeah, yeah. They, 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 drop, they, they don't they all drop dead when it gets to 31 degrees yeah it's like most things they can they can have a night drop a small night drop because they don't want to get too cold yeah and don't take that the wrong way i wouldn't yeah, get lower yeah. than 18 degrees but 30 degrees for a day they should be okay yeah. you can spray them you know you can put cold water in a sprayer if you need to and spray it but obviously in the uk we don't we get hot we do recently have had hot spells yeah i've never lost anything to heat but i right, have okay. lost one or two to cold okay that's interesting yeah. yeah but i think my main concern at the moment I, i've got to wait a while because i'm not sure what the temperatures are doing because yeah. where the space is between like where I, the space i've got for a vivarium is between my ackies and my gill and i viv right, uh, yeah. what it's quite it's not like hot hot but the yeah. the viv above and below are like 60 degree basking yeah. points so i want to make and, sure in the yeah. summer it's not too hot yeah and as well with um like lighting i know because jungle dawns are really good but yeah. they're really expensive yeah so i don't use i've got some but i don't buy them anymore i buy um they're just i can't remember what they're called they're like three or four foot led batons from amazon Okay, yeah, like your undercounter um, lighting sort of things. Yeah, they're quite yeah. wide, and anything at about sixty four hundred k is what you want because that'll grow the plant still. Yeah, some people are starting to keep UVB on darts, and I think there's some studies that say for Ufaga pamilio and other Ufaga species they will use it slightly, but like we supplement darts quite a lot and there's not been much to show different right. between them yet anyway yeah um so at the minute i'm just using leds um okay and then um obviously like jungle, some... yeah go on carry on yeah, ju jungle dawns as well with these leds they don't get warm but jungle dawns get quite warm yeah so even if you are that bit colder the jungle dawn if you're using jungle dawns or something like that in the daytime it will actually bring tank heat up one or two right. degrees anyway yeah that's fair enough. And then, um, obviously, as you're not you, you, using UVB, yeah. what sort of supplements are you using? And then how often are you supplementing them as well? Yeah, so even if people do use UVB, dart frog supplementation is a must. So the main food source for dart frogs in the hobby is fruit flies. There are people starting to use other things like aphids and um, bean beetles, I think. You know, there are some hobbyists out there culturing their own. I yeah. culture all my own flies now. And it's really easy once you know what to do. I buy the Rapashi Superfly. I buy it in three kilo tubs, so it's quite expensive to buy. You can you can buy it in smaller tubs, but you literally mix it up with kettle water. Yeah. Get yourself some wood wool excelsior. Um and I use the same pot. So I make four cultures a week. Yeah, four cultures a week, and I have about yeah. sixteen to twenty on the go at a time. Wow, okay um and you just take flies from two weeks ago or last week you tip yeah. them into your new cultures and then within 10 days you'll have more flies i'm using yeah. melanogasta mainly and the thing with fruit flies and like you feed springtails and i do have isopods in all the tanks they really have no nutritional benefit whatsoever yeah so you need to supplement your darts and i'm feeding 
people will feed in different sort of regimes. At this point, I'm feeding my darts three times a week. Um, and they have um, Rapashi Calcium Plus, is it? The one with the leopard gecko on? Yeah. Um, every feed. So it's as simple as getting a, a deli cup or like a fruit fly cup like pour your powder in and then you literally just tap out flies so and give it a shake and you, can, you can you can end up with a big pot of flies you will have loads escape obviously yeah but um yeah and so that that every feed and then the other really important thing is vitamin a supplement so i think right. that is rapashi's one with the dart frog on right um they can get dart frogs can get i think it's hyper and hypo vitamin aosis or whatever it is either way they can be deficient or they can get too much of it so yeah they need it but they don't need it much once every two to four weeks right okay. once every two weeks i guess is more important if you're breeding but yeah once every i do have every, every two weeks but, yeah um once every two to four weeks you don't really want to do it any more than that um because they yeah it can affect yeah. them in different ways um but that's the two things i'm doing currently i'm probably gonna start to add in carotenoids which is like a it's like a coloring supplement so for the like red and orange frogs yeah it's, it's like i think it's like a similar thing basically as what's in carrots it gives oh, it okay. that color so yeah. um it's like putting feed for animals as well yeah. so i'm actually an egg farmer okay. and you can put carotenoids in the feed and that's what makes the egg more orange and yellow it's not the chicken it can be with some breeds but um so you, you can color an egg yolk basically by what you feed a chicken. Oh, so it's similar to that. every day of school day, I'd never yeah. known that. So, um, yeah, dart frogs mainly for like red and orange ones. I don't do it currently. I've been meaning to start doing it, but you can mix in carotenoids even in the fruit fly culture, so yeah. that the flies eat it, and then the frogs eat it from the flies, or you can just dust flies. But yeah, I think a lot a lot of people are starting to look more into dart frog supplementation and things like that. Um, through different things so i'll probably add that in yeah um, but that yeah the calcium plus and the vitamin a that is your main dart frog supplements that you definitely want to be doing okay that's yeah that's, that's yeah, yeah. That, it makes perfect sense to be fair um yeah, yeah fair enough um and i presume oh yeah no, actually that's a stupid question i was going to say are there any brands that you like to go for but i suppose if that advertising it is what it is that it doesn't matter what brands they are um i tend to use apache um, yeah but I don't know if you've heard of them. So Fantastic Frogs UK, they're based up in North Wales. They've just started making their own supplement line. Um, right, okay. So, so they now make a line um, and they've got loads of different ones. So they've got different types of vitamins and like super vites and stuff like that, specifically yeah. sort of catered to dart frogs. Um, oh, brilliant. That's really good. Um, right, so we like, have to... Yeah. yeah, go on. Sorry, Karen. So I, I was going to say, Fantastic Frogs is also a great place to buy plants um and all your dart frog needs they're they're, re they're really good um yeah nice, really good nice. um so we've been going just over an hour so i have got to start wrapping it up is there anything else yeah. that you wanted to add to the frog conversation maybe something that people um, sort of not necessarily think of when they first get into frogs or something that you think people should be more aware of than they are or talk about more than they do um I'm not sure really. I'm, um, I think people tend to get into them, think of them as a frog that needs loads and loads of water and yeah. um, stuff like that. And don't get me wrong, they need, they need water. Obviously, they're amphibians. But yeah, I put dishes in my tanks. You really don't need to be doing. You can, you can have like rainfall systems down a wall, but you really don't need to be doing pools because there is a danger there. Yeah. Some people do it successfully. Don't get me wrong, but for someone who's beginning, for someone who's beginning, you spray them down the tank, and I only spray my tanks every other day now, really. Yeah. Unless it's obviously really hot, or the rooms drying out because the heater, um, and that little water dish is, is plenty for them. Right. And. The leaf litter on top you don't want that to be wet you want that to be dry you want them to be able to get away from the wet layer underneath so the idea of spraying them every other day is it give it everything a chance yeah. to soak it down but then it you gives the leaf litter to dry it, out but it can dry out yeah like 
um, that leaflet is a great humidity barrier. Obviously, the soil underneath can be wet, and that leaflet is locking in that humidity. But you want the leaflet and a couple of layers of leaflet on top to be that bit dry, so they've got stuff. Obviously, if you've got climbing stuff in the tank, they can get away from the floor. But yeah. you really want to give them that opportunity to um, not be soaking all the time. It, it, yeah, it doesn't make perfect sense. Doesn't do wonders for them. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Right. Um. So. The final question, well, the, the final sort of podcast question of the day um, is, if you could give yourself, hang on, I can't even read today. If you could give your 10-year-old self a piece of advice, what would that advice be? Um, if you have a passion for something, don't lose it along the way. Try and go for it. Yeah, nice. I like it. You, I might, love get back, you might get back to it one day like I have. But for some reason, along the way, I've lost it. Yeah. Uh, like when I was a teenager, and um, that's fine. I'm back into it now. But maybe if I'd have carried it on, I might have gone into something in a professional sense. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy where I am. You know, I work on a family farm. I'm very happy, but I possibly would have ventured into something different if I'd have carried yeah. it on when I was younger. No, perfect. Absolutely perfect. And then finally, where can people find you if they want to know some more? Um. So. The main thing is Instagram, and for some people probably know, some people won't know. I actually lost my account just after Christmas, um, which was a shame. I had a feature on BBC Earth on that account, and I just had a real, you know, get two million views and over a hundred thousand likes. Yeah. So I'm on my new account, which I've actually just gained about two hundred followers the last few days for a yeah. prompt call. Yeah, you're really doing really well. Which, I don't know. It, t- people tend to come to my account to watch Final Bait is terrible as cool, which is, is fine <laughs> by me. Um, so it was a it was a bit of a pain losing that account. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's numbers on the screen. I've started again. So if you want to follow me, I'm now at, at Rural Reptiles Two on Instagram. And like you said earlier, I've, I have started a YouTube channel. Um, it's there if anyone wants to watch sort of hairpin videos. I'm going to try and do and sort of just wildlife walks yeah. stuff like and find th- things like that uh, is the direction i'm going um and that's just rural reptiles on Inst- uh youtube but yeah perfect and the links are um in the show notes probably just the link to the instagram because i tend to do one but there'll be a yeah, link and you'll be able to find the rest of the links if you want to um so there we go thank you very much ben i've really really enjoyed this conversation don't go anywhere i'm just going to wrap up say goodbye um, and yep. then we will, we will f- finish off in the wings afterwards. Um, but yeah, Great. hopefully you've enjoyed being on. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure there'll be a round two, not that far away. Yeah, I think I've probably done too much talking, but hopefully... No, it's, it's a podcast. People are supposed to talk. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Right. Um, I will catch up with you in just a minute, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Well, there we go. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I've probably got more questions in my head now than when I started the episode. Um, so I'm going to be in and out of Ben's DMs for the next foreseeable year, probably. Um, so I've really enjoyed it. If you want to keep up to date with what's going on with the Reptor Chat podcast and the Reptor Chat vlogs, um, go and check out Instagram or Facebook. Just search Reptor Chat and I'm sure we will pop up. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the show, there is a Patreon available. It opens you up to a private Discord where you get early access to extra content, pre-recorded episodes. It starts as little as £1 a month, and there's even even, even, even a seven-day free trial. All the links are in the show notes below. So that's that. I've been your host, Ben McIntyre, and this has been a Reptor Chat podcast. I will see you in a fortnight. Goodbye. <laughs>